Dr. Catherine Roxanne Growey, better known as Dr. Roxy online, um, was a doctor near Central Ohio who got in trouble after she live streamed some patient surgeries on TikTok and some other social media apps. Growey was stripped of her license to practice medicine in Ohio in July after uh, she was accused of injuring some patients who uh, had their procedures filmed both on and off camera. The Columbus Dispatch spoke to Mary Jenkins, one of Growey's early patients um, who underwent a breast reconstruction by the doctor. She was one of the first patients to file a lawsuit against Growey in 2014. Here's that full interview. So I was first diagnosed in January of 2006. Um, actually, it was funny. It was the result, official results came in on Friday the 13th, 2006. So it was like, ooh. Um, but I was diagnosed then, and I was diagnosed with invasive ductal carcinoma, triple negative, stage three, almost stage four. And so my only options were aggressive chemotherapy and surgery. And so I started aggressive chemo, hoping to shrink the mass, um, but it didn't shrink. And so as a result, I had my right breast removed. At, during that time when I was going through chemotherapy, I got laid off work um, because and it's crazy the way it happened. I was going through chemo and I was still trying to work, but I would get really hot. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, when I would go to work, I would lay down on the floor in the bathroom to try to get cool. And my employer found out and they said that they were gonna let me go so that I could focus on recovering. Which initially I thought that was a great thing because then I wouldn't have to get up early and go to work and try to force myself to work. But when I went, you know, went through all of my savings, the bills still had to get paid. So you don't work, you don't get a paycheck. Bills had to be paid and um, I found myself running out of money and still had bills. And so I went to um, a, well, a local well-known cancer organization to ask for help and found out that they didn't use the money that they raised to help in the way that I needed. And so that started me on a journey to find help. Um, because what I needed was help to make certain that my cable wouldn't get turned off, my utilities wouldn't get turned off, my car wouldn't get repossessed, the insurance canceled, the rent paid, those bills, and there wasn't anybody. Um, I hadn't been unemployed long enough to apply for welfare, um, so I was over income. And it was like, what do you do? Who do you turn to? And so um, I ended up turning to my church, and my church agreed to pay my bills for me, which was an absolute blessing. But at the same time, I was like, what about everybody else? Because I knew if it was happening to me, chances are it was happening to others as well. And so, um, so I was, was it by this point? still in 2006, still in so I was still in treatment. <laughs> and so my pastor was like, well, Mary, what do you want to do? And I said, we got to find somebody that can let people know where money does and doesn't go in the world of cancer. And he was like, you're right, Mary. And I was like, you're right, pastor. <laughs> and that's when um, I said, not me. And he said, why not you? And at first I was afraid because I really didn't know what people would think. And going into, you know, we're in, we're in Columbus. And Columbus is a huge research town. And then there was going to be little old me with this message of, hey, there's people that need help. Can y'all use some of your money to help the people? And I just didn't know how it was going to turn out, but I said yes. I mean, I was like, if I don't ask, everybody's going to say no, so I might as well let people know and ask. Somebody might say yes. And people said yes, and so we, I started this organization. And at the time, it was Christians Overcoming Cancer, because for me, it was my church and I, we were going to overcome cancer. <laughs> we were going to help cancer patients succeed on their road to recovery. <laughs> Those are the joys. And it started out so fast because once other people found out, people started coming from everywhere, needing help at the same time, wanting to help. And so that was great. And I will never forget, shout out to Grant Hospital because they referred a woman to us that had cervical cancer. And I remember her coming and saying that she needed $150 or her car was going to get repossessed. And I remember asking her, you know, what type of breast cancer do you have? And she said, I don't have breast cancer, I have cervical cancer. 
And I told her I was sorry we couldn't help her because she had the wrong type of cancer, which in the moment it was like, what is the right type of cancer? Who, who says that? that just, and I told her, just wait a minute, I'm gonna fix it. And so I reached out to the board members and explained to them that I never wanted to tell someone they had the wrong type of cancer ever again in life. And they asked me, was I sure? And I said, absolutely. And they're like, okay, in my mind, I meant in Columbus. But we didn't say that. So we changed the mission to provide services to all cancer patients. If they're in active treatment and they have a need. Well, the American Cancer Society found out. <laughs> and they started sending people from Georgia and Texas and California and New York. And it was like, oh my God. And then it just spread across the country. And I will, will never forget, before we were a year old, we got a referral from Collingswood, Ontario, Canada, which meant we were international. <laughs> and it was like, how did that happen? And then from there, we got a referral from um, Mexico. And then it just went across. And I was like, what are we doing? How did this happen? And how are we going to sustain this and maintain this? And then it was like, we have to become creative. And that's what we did. Like, if I make eye contact with a person, I'm going to tell them. And I'm going to ask them to support the organization. <laughs> so all my fears went out the window. So I did that and focused on that for six years. Built the organization. Um, we had volunteers across the country. We had people here. We were doing it. And then I got an email. It was in October of 2012. I got an email invitation to hear this doctor that was sharing the latest breakthroughs in, re in reconstruction. Was there who I think it was? <laughs> <laughs> yes. And so I get this email and I'm like, hmm, it's been six years. I hadn't thought about reconstruction. I was wearing a prosthetic. I'm building the organization. I wonder what the latest advances are in reconstruction. So I'm going to go to this workshop. So I get to the workshop and there's this surgeon, super energetic, very bubbly, very happy, just talking about reconstruction and said that there were really no new advances, but this is what could, they could do. And I'm like, okay, okay, I'm here. Why am I here, God? <laughs> Literally. And so after she finished her presentation, she got, we got to go around the room. There were probably about five to eight people there. And people went around, and they introduced who they were. And so I was the last person to speak. And so I explained that my name is, and I am the founder of, and this is what we do. And she said, thank you for coming, closed the meeting, and then walked directly to me. And she was like, oh my God, when you were talking, I felt goosebumps. And I believe that God brought us together and maybe Maybe I'm supposed to introduce you to some doctors to help you raise money. Or maybe I'm supposed to do your reconstruction. Did you have reconstruction? And I said, no, I, actually I hadn't, hadn't thought about it. I mean, I've been building the organization for six years. And she said, well, let's go over to my office because the, her, her office was literally like steps away from where the meeting was held. Went into her office and it was brand new and, um, she was like, well, I got to get some information. So I noticed the paperwork and I was like, oh, okay, this is generic paperwork <laughs> because I, I didn't realize then that it was super new. Like she was just uh, opening. Just starting. You know? Right. Um, and so when I, when I read the information that she had typed up, I was like, there should be a comma here and this word is spelled wrong. And I mean, because it was that new. Uh -huh. And she was like, okay, great, Mary, I should have you come in and do, you know, read all my paperwork. <laughs> like, don't have time for that, but okay. Right. Then she, we talked about having the tram flap with the tummy tuck. And she told me that I was a perfect candidate because I was, even though I was 45, um, I was a perfect candidate and that. You know, it would give me the opportunity to have my breast back. And I was like, man, and I can get a flat stomach out of it. Okay, this sure. works for me. Right. I explained to her that I had a speaking engagement the first weekend of December. And so whatever I was going to do, it had to make sure that I would be okay for that. And it was October um, at this point. And this was October, right. And so, and I told her that I did have a speaking engagement on October 21st. 
And so as long as we can coordinate it, let's do it. And she and her assistant said, let me make, make some phone calls. You're, oh, you're in luck. We can schedule on October 22nd. Okay. I didn't know she was renting ORs at the time. So it was like, okay. So on the 22nd, I'm going to never forget, it was 6 o'clock in the morning. My family was there, and I was getting ready to go under the knife. And what I did was um, I had my cell phone with me, which is crazy. Um, I was taking pictures because I said one day I was going to write a book, and I wanted to have all these pictures. So the, the anesthesiologist, the nurse, like mm. a picture of her. I mean, and it's like, we're going to do this. I had no idea what I was really doing because those photos and all the photos that I took actually supported my claim when we went to court. And so that's how I got connected with her. Went in on October 22nd, had the surgery, um, woke up to a breast, flat stomach, like, oh my goodness, this is real. Okay. Excited. Um, my friend Kia had stayed with me. Um, and then I went to sleep. And when I woke up, the tissue was like to speak, which meant something was wrong. Um, it had swelled. Um, and so I, you know, contact the nurse, <laughs> something's wrong, nurse, something's wrong, call the doctor. Um, no one had the phone number, which is crazy. No one on staff in St. Anne's had her phone number, which you, you would think, how could that happen? Fortunately, I had her cell phone number because I actually was engaging with her prior to. Um, so I gave them her cell phone number, and when they came back in the room, they told me that um, she couldn't come in because she was having dinner with her family, but ordered leech therapy, as in leeches, like leeches. I didn't know anyone still did that. <laughs> they, they do that for like fingertips. They don't do that for, right. you know, big tissues. And so um, I had leech therapy done. And the crazy thing is, there was no one in the hospital that knew how to do it. That was even worse. So here, Roxanne Growey had ordered me to have leech therapy, but there was no one that knew how to do it. And so my friend Kia literally Googled how to do leech therapy. And that's how she learned how to do it. And she was the one that put the leeches on and showed them. And so while she was doing it, the nurses' stations would come in and stand around the bed and watch the woman who's having leech therapy. Yes, for like all night. Out the day. I, yeah, I can't imagine that was very comfortable. It wasn't. One, <laughs> one way. You know, I don't even know what all I was thinking then. Sure. But I guess I didn't even know to be traumatized because it was so unbelievable that this was happening. And I was concerned about what was ha going to happen to the tissue. And so the next morning, she shows up and she looks at Still's tissues real big. And she was like, we've got to take you back in, back in surgery. And I was like, okay, I signed the form, um, went back into surgery. I'm boohoo crying because I'm thinking, save the tissue. Mm -hmm. You know, if you can save it, save it. We went into surgery. And I remember coming out of surgery and she's saying, you know, Mary, God must be on your side because we couldn't get the blood to come out of it. I took the tissue and I put it on the, t on the, on the tray and I just whacked it and blood started coming out of it. And I was like, okay. She said, and then I put it back. And that's how she ended up resetting the tissue. Um, I was glad that I still had a tissue because it was like, okay, there's still hope. Um, from there, I got put in intensive care, and I was in intensive care for about a week. And that's when she brought her daughter to meet me because um, she wanted her daughter to meet the woman that had started the cancer organization that was helping people, which... <laughs> You're like laying in the ICU. And <laughs> Literally. Like, yeah. I'm, I mean, it was like I couldn't lay all the way back because of having the tram... The, the, I guess you call called the tummy tuck portion. So I still had to, so I was in this awkward kind of bed, but she brought her daughter in and it's like, okay. 
Okay, this is this. You're in this uncomfortable position because it's like this woman. You need this woman to like make sure you're okay. Mm -hmm. And, mm -hmm. yeah. Yep. And she's like, "How are things going?" And I'm like, "I think it's okay," because I think my wanting it to be okay made me kind of feel like I could feel something. Like maybe it was like it was working. And so uh, after being in the hospital or in intensive care for about a week, she moved me to um, a private room. In the private room, they would come in and try to help me to get to where I could kind of stand up right. And after a few days of being there, she came in and said, you know, Mary, I'm concerned about you developing a hospital-born infection. So you might want to go ahead and find a nursing home that can take care of you instead of being in the hospital okay, is there one near my house? <laughs> and there happened to be one up the street from where I live, which used to be Villa Angela. It's now the Laurels. And so um, she said she'd make the arrangements to have me transported over there. And so it was the night of November the 2nd. I will never forget. Um, they came really late. And so it was, it was going on midnight when they picked me up and got me actually into Villa Angela. And when I got there, they had no orders for me. So I was in excruciating pain. They had no pain meds. And so I had to wait until they could coordinate that. Um, by then I started having the chills mm. and um, whew, going all the way back. I started having the chills and I just was, you know, hot, sweating and couldn't get warm. and was asking for multiple heated blankets and things of that nature. And um, I would ask her to come and see me. And every time she had an excuse. She had an excuse for why she couldn't come. So I wasn't being seen when I was in the nursing home. The nurses were coming in and, you know, they were like, well, you know, we're going to, we're going to check. And I would notice that there were these little black spots that were starting to form and they were getting bigger. And so crazy me, I'm thinking, you know, going back to my childhood when I would ride a bicycle and I'd fall off and um, scab my knee and, you know, I'd, you know, injure my knee and a scab would form over it and then the scab would come off and there'd be good tissue underneath. So that's what I'm thinking is happening. Not trying realizing, to trying to stay hopeful because I'm like, not knowing that it had become necrotic. It started getting worse when the tissue started falling forward to where I could look down and actually see my ribs. So that was an experience in itself. And so I remember just, I was drugged up so much. They kept giving me pain meds and pain meds and pain meds and I would sleep like hours upon hours people would tell me you know they, they had came and seen me but I was asleep and I didn't even know that they were there and so this one night it was three o'clock in the morning this I was asleep and I woke up and there was a woman standing in the end of my bed and this woman said hi I'm nurse Tina and I was like hi and can I help you? And why are you in my room at three o'clock in the morning? And she said, the tissue on you has died and it's killing you. And if you don't get it removed right away, you're gonna die. And then she walked out. Um, Did you ever meet Nurse Tina again or what? No. No. Mm -mm. So Nurse Tina, um, the next morning, I was like, who's Nurse Tina? Where is she? and ask people like, was she on staff? How could I get a hold of her? And they looked and they're like, we didn't have a nurse Tina on duty. And I was like, okay, oh, okay. So I am crazy enough to believe that that was an angel sent. And I was like, what? So now I'm like, my, the fight in me just came and I stayed up and the next day I called Roxanne. And I told her, I said, I need to get this tissue off me as soon as possible. She actually wanted to wait a week um, to schedule, I kid you not. She wanted to wait a week 
to schedule where I could be in, have inpatient, so yeah. to make the arrangement with the hospital to get me transported. So that way, if anything happened, um, I would be at the hospital. I told her no. I said, I don't care if it's outpatient surgery. I just need it removed. And so that following Wednesday, <laughs> um, I had it removed as outpatient surgery. And so they, unfortunately, the magnitude of the infection and the necrosis and the dying of the tissue, along with my tissue, left a wound from here to here, from here to here. Um, and they had to put, um, there was a black sponge about this thick. They had to fill the area in because there was no tissue to cover it. Um, tissue had to grow from the inside out. And that was traumatic in itself because I had a wound vac machine now that was like suctioning fluid out of the area. Um, at the same time, I'm still trying to figure out what in the world's going on. When are you coming to see me? And that's when she informed me that now I was no longer in her care. Oh, of course. It was like, I'm in a nursing home and these people don't know what they're doing. <laughs> so now I'm here with this. And they said that uh, I had an aide that was gonna come and change the sponge because I had to have it changed every three days. And I remember the very first time they gave me two Percocets, told me it would be enough to, to where I wouldn't feel anything. And when they started, they had to literally turn the wound vac machine off and then take the tape that was holding it down, lift the tape up so that they could take the sponge out. Well, it wasn't enough pain mitts. And so when they pulled it and they started to pull the sponge out, it ripped the tissue. When I say I screamed at a level I didn't know I could, there were people later on, I found out that people from the other sections were like, was that you that screamed that loud? Because it was so ungodly painful. Um, and still she wouldn't show up. And so granted, we're now going into 2013. So with the wound vac machine, I went to my speaking engagement because oh my God. <laughs> I, <laughs> I'm that person. Yeah, well, that's amazing. <laughs> yeah, so I, I went to the speaking engagement. People were like, what is the bag? I was like, long story. Y'all won't believe where I'm at. Mm -hmm. And when I explained it to people, they couldn't believe it. They're like, you're in a nursing home? I'm like, yes, this is what happened. And they're like, oh my God. And so after that speaking engagement, went back to the nursing home, some weeks passed and it was time for my left breast checkup, January of 2013. And that is when I went to go see my breast health doctor, Dr. Mark Cripe. I love me some him. <laughs> Um, I went to see him, and when he entered the room, because you, you get put in the room, you, you change and everything. When he entered the room, he was like, Mary Jenkins, I know you're doing great things. How's the organization doing? Are you still raising money? Because you know, he just knew mm -hmm. that I was out there doing something with my life. And I was like, no, I'm in a nursing home. And he asked why. And I explained to him that... Uh, I had reconstruction surgery. He was like, how do you have reconstruction surgery? And I not know. And I was like, cause I know people. I, w I went around you and I'm so sorry. So he asked me who did the surgery and I told him. And he was like, oh no, Mary. I, if I would have told you don't do it if I had to know. And I was like, well, I did. And I'm in a nursing home and I got to move back because of the sponge in my chest and he was like oh hon let me see what let me see what was done to you and when I explained to him the details he was like let's get you with somebody that might could be able to help you and um, he connected me with Dr. Menarchek and in being connected with him that's when you know we started talking about the details and based off of the details he was like I'm going to transfer you to another doctor because you, what's going on, you just need to talk to somebody else. 
And so when he did, that doctor was like, um, you're going to need a good attorney. <laughs> and I was like, why? And he was like, trust me, you're going to need a good attorney. And they looked at records and things and I got connected. The first, and it's something, the first attorney that I had reached out to, um, literally told me I, it wasn't possible that I could win my case. Um, he said, you got a case, but I don't see you winning it because, and I hate to say it, but she's a prominent white female doctor mm -hmm. and you're you. And I was like, what's that supposed to mean? <laughs> because I, I wasn't thinking along those lines in any way. And so he said, but I can refer you to somebody. So he referred me to somebody. Um, and Rebecca, I love Rebecca. Rebecca's company, um, I don't remember the name of the law firm she was with, but Rebecca was like, you definitely have a case, definitely. And I'm gonna go to bat for you and I'm gonna talk to the partners and we're gonna do this because this is wrong. Well, those partners were like, you definitely have a case, but it's gonna take a lot of money. Um, and uh, you know, what is it that you want out of this? Mm. And I would explain, I want her license. Right. That I want her not to be able to do to anybody else what she did to me and you know they said well, well we'll see what we can do and they came back and said that they couldn't and so I was like okay so now I got a case but I can't find an attorney that was that's you know that's brave enough to take my case and Re I remember Rebecca saying there is one attorney in this city and if he takes your case you're definitely gonna win and I was like that's who I need and it was David Scheuer with Kali Scheuer and Abraham. And I remember meeting with David the first time. And he was like, so tell me what happened. And I gave him the quick summary, told him I had pictures. And he was like, okay, let me see. And I showed him and he said, mm, okay. And he asked, what did I want out of it? And I told him, I want her license. And he said, you know, most people don't want that. They have some type of dollar amount. I said, mm -mm, I'm not in it for the money. I don't care about the money. I care that she is not able to do this to anybody else ever again. And so we went to court and um, I won the case and she appealed and then I won the appeal. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately the medical board didn't make a decision to um, discipline her then. And she, by then she was on a whole new scale because oh, yeah. she had become TikTok famous and they had reached out to her in 2018. But when my case was, was fully won in 2019, um, I think they believed they had already started correcting her. So they didn't, might not have needed to do something else, but they didn't do enough. And so there's a lot of people that I truly believe had they made a decision then wouldn't have been injured.